Okay. And then you could just go ahead and introduce yourself and, you know, start your talk. Okay. All right. Well, um, hi, it's great to be here with um, all of the people here tonight. And I really appreciate Jane giving me this opportunity. Um, I'm Marcia Montenegro and I was in the new age for a good 20 years. And so that's my topic that I'm speaking on tonight. I'm going to just give you a little brief background. I'm not going to go into my whole story, but my story is online on my website, uh, which is uh, christiananswersforthenewage.org. So, you know, if you go there, um, I have my story in detail and I have a lot of articles on my articles page on different subjects, different um, new age and occult topics. So you can just check that out. So a lot of the stuff I'm gonna talk about tonight, I'll have articles on on my website. So um, my background, um, even though I grew up attending church here and there because my father was a foreign service officer. So we lived overseas and um, we weren't in any kind of consistent pattern of church. My father was an agnostic and my mother was um, I, what I would call a nominal Christian, um, but she thought children should go to church. So my sister and I were taken to, to various churches. And when we came back from overseas and lived in what the Washington DC area, which is actually where I'm living right now, um, I went to a Baptist church uh, and I got very involved. I went to Sunday school and I went to the youth group and I went to the service and everything. Um, but I never really understood. <laughs> I did not, if you had asked me what the gospel was, I, I wouldn't have known how to answer that question. You know, I, I just wouldn't have known what you meant. Um, I knew about Jesus. I knew he died on the cross. Uh, it just didn't mean anything to me. And I started questioning the Bible the truth of the Bible. And I started just questioning Christianity. I had several friends in high school who were not Christians. And I began to just decide that I was going to pursue other religions. I was going to explore other religions, you know, at once I got out of high school. And so when I got into college, of course, I didn't have a lot of time, too much time to do that in college because I was busy. But I did, I did to a certain extent read some things. I got very interested in Eastern religions in, in college. And I had already been interested in starting around, gosh, really, really young, like 11 or 12 in the supernatural. Um, and why, I don't know. That was not something my parents showed any interest in or had any interest in at all, especially my father. Um, but I had this this kind of burning interest in it. I had some experiences um, that made me more interested. Uh, one when I was young and then a couple in college. And then, so after college, I pursued uh, two, two paths mainly. One was the supernatural and one was um, like other religions and Eastern religions especially. So I was going in that direction and I was interested in um, psychics talking to the dead. Uh, I had been interested in astrology in high school. So I already had that interest. And I read a lot of different kinds of books, um, had some more experiences. And it's kind of like as time went by, I got more and more focused on those areas and I had a class that introduced me to a, a type of meditation. Um, and that meditation, um, I'm, I'm skipping over some things here to make it a little shorter. That meditation introduced me to my, my what he, the teacher called our spiritual master, um, who was basically my spirit guide. And after that, I got involved with the Tibetan Buddhist group. And then I got into Zen Buddhism. And then I decided I wanted to study something that I could use to help people. And so I studied astrology. 
and I became a licensed astrologer in the city of Atlanta. You could do that. Oh, by this time, I'm sorry, after college, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. I went to, to college in Florida, I was living in Atlanta, Georgia. And Atlanta, Georgia um, allowed you to practice astrology legally if you had a business license. And to qualify for the business license, you had to show that you knew astrology. So you either had to take the test given by the American Federation of Astrologers, which is uh, given nationally in different cities at different times of the year, um, or you could take the test given in Atlanta that was set up by the Atlanta Board of Astrology Examiners. And I took that test, it was a seven hour exam and I passed <laughs> and I bought my business license and I started practicing as a professional astrologer and got extremely involved with the Astrological Society. I was doing a Zen Buddhist meditation, which is called mindfulness, which is now like a trend in this country. Um, and it's not, you know, mindfulness is Buddhist meditation. You can't make it secular, but it's, try, it's presented as a secular thing. Um, and then uh, I just continued on this path and I was extremely involved. Um, became president of the Astrological Society. I was chairperson of the Atlanta Board of Astrology Examiners. I was writing for several um, New Age and astrological journals, and I was also a, on the Speakers Bureau of the Astrological Society. So I was speaking to different groups in Atlanta, like the Lions Club and Parents Without Partners and everything. Then skipping over <laughs> a big part here, God intervened in my life and it's it's a kind of a, it's kind of an unusual story it was a, over a period of several months god actually got me to give astrology up uh, before i was even a christian and then while i was reading the bible I, I my eyes were opened and i saw who jesus was and so that's a very short short shortened form of this of the story which is on my website so there's also a lot of um, podcasts and stuff where i give my testimony if you Google it, um, there's a lot of programs where that's all I do is give this story in great detail. And so uh, I all of a sudden I was a Christian and I had been in the New Age for like 20 years. All my friends were New Agers. Um, I didn't have any Christians to like mentor me or disciple me. I was in this very, very open-minded church um, where some of the people asked for my business card, you know, my astrological business card, <laughs> believe it or not. So um, I was sort of at sea, but, you know, the Lord was looking after me and I got through that time in my life. Um, and eventually... Um, a few years later, uh, people started asking me to share my story and share or talk about the new age. And eventually that led to a full-time ministry. So I have been in full-time ministry since 1998. So that's 23 years I've been doing this full-time and I speak and write and uh, answer questions a lot. <laughs> and by the way, before I forget, um, I am on Facebook. My, my ministry page is Christian Answers for the New Age. So if you want to follow that, I put up posts there about the New Age and the occult quite frequently. Um, or any podcast or anything I'm on, I'll, I'll post there. So um, please check that out if you want to and check out my website. So those are the two places where you can um, see what, you know, what I'm saying and, and doing. Um, about the new age. So here we are in 2021. And I never thought that I would see so much new age stuff in the church. Um, I have really been kind of uh, blown away by it. Uh, I saw some things, you know, years ago, and I would, I would speak about it. Um, and it's just gradually increased. Uh, and, and here's the thing to know about the new age. It is always it always appears helpful, positive, and life-affirming. 
It always appears helpful, positive, and life affirming. Um, this is one reason it's so seductive. It doesn't ever look or hardly ever look evil. It doesn't ever look, you know, um, like just kind of uh, like something shallow. It, it will often appear to be something really clever or deep. Um, but it's always beneficial. There's always something for you. There's always something you can gain from it. Um, or that it appears, when I say that, I mean it appears there's something you can gain from it. Um, so this is one of the reasons the new age, it, it makes such progress in the culture and in the church. Um, I mean, there are other reasons it's, I think it's made progress in the church, but it's very, and then the other reason that it makes progress is that it's fluid. So it's very fluid and it's very adaptable. Okay, it's not a fixed thing. So it's not like a religion, like, you know, take the take any religion um, or take a, re, or a cult maybe like, we were talking about the Mormons earlier, <laughs> like the Mormon church. Okay, the Mormon church has certain fixed, kind of fixed beliefs. And I know their beliefs can change with their, their present day apostles and all that. But there's still a certain core set of ideas and beliefs and it's somewhat controlled. You can't just, make it into anything you want. Um, and so there's certain things you address if you're addressing that. And so you don't see like the spread of Mormonism like you see the new age in the culture. It's it's just more limited in, in what it's teaching. Whereas the new age, not only is it fluid and adaptable, but it merges with other things, okay? That's one of its characteristics. It merges with other things, so it merges with, um, it merges with Buddhism, it merges with Hinduism, it merges with Christianity. And, you know, it, it will take terms from those religions or uh, concepts and then kind of spin it. And so it, you'll hear something or read something and it'll be familiar because it's using familiar language, but the meaning uh, behind it is different. And this is, this is one of the deceptions of it. So there's, there's a lot of examples then. Um, it just, it's just uh, one of the, just one of the most deceptive uh, things that I can think of is the new age movement. Um, it also, because it's so fluid and adaptive, adaptable um, and it merges with these other religions so it becomes sort of syncretism. So it's much harder to identify because of this, people can't, don't know how to pin it down. They don't know how to define it. They don't really know what's the new age. You know, they can give their opinion of it or they can say, oh, I think it's believing in crystals, you know, or something like that. But it's very hard for most people to really define it or to even describe it to anybody. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because it's so vast. It's so incredibly vast. It covers a huge spectrum of beliefs. And um, these spectrum of beliefs come primarily from three areas, like kind of like the three origins, the three main origins of the modern New Age movement. Um, the first one is Gnosticism which goes way back to the early church and the early forms of Gnosticism um, were even addressed in some of the New Testament books like Colossians and 1 John. So they were dealing with some early forms of Gnosticism. And, and the Gnostic idea is that the spiritual is good and the material world is bad. The material world is evil. And you see that in the new age with the idea that spiritual things are always superior to anything material. So everything in the new age is about transcending um, the material world, transcending the body, transcend, everything's about transcending. That's a really big word in the new age. And, you know, the, the idea is that you're sort of trapped in um, you're, or maybe limited, they might not say trapped, limited in a body, 
um, you're limited in this lifetime and you're limited to this earth. Uh, so the idea is that you have to raise, you have to advance spiritually and raise your spiritual level. And they might even say raise your spiritual vibration so that you can, you know, get more spiritual and get spiritually higher to higher levels. And then see, you can begin to kind of break the bonds of the material world. So there's a lot of teachings just around this one idea. Um, and some people even go to extremes with it. And there are people who believe that you can raise your vibrations and advance like this by not eating. And so you have the breatharians who, uh, you know, this is the philosophy that you can get to the point where you're not eating and you're just living on air and sunshine. Okay. Now the problem is, of course, we're not plants. We can't live... <laughs> We can't live on air and sunshine. <laughs> um, and I don't think anybody has. There are people who claim that they've done it. You know, and there's tales of people who have done this. But anybody who's really tried, unless they start eating again, they die. So, um, but there is this idea. And I knew someone who wanted to try this when I was in the New Age. He was very close to me. And he tried, he, he decided he prepared for it by just getting down to a diet of oranges and peanuts. And so he just did oranges and peanuts for a while. And then he was going to just not have food at all, but he didn't, he didn't make it. So <laughs> I guess he got hungry. I'm not sure his reasoning, but I, this is a real kind of thinking that you find in the new age. So, and this idea of raising your vibration and having a higher vibration is extremely common. So everything's about vibration. So there's an idea that everything is energy. We're all energy. We all have vibrations and we're all vibrating at different levels. And the more spiritual you are, the higher your vibration, see? So sometimes it's taught by having certain diets, like if you're vegetarian, you will have a higher vibration. If you're vegan, you'll have an even higher vibration. Now I wanna emphasize there are people who are vegetarians and vegans who are not new agers. So I just wanna put that out there. I did become a vegetarian. Um, I was not really fully in the new age. I was kind of getting into it, but I became a vegetarian because of my um, animal rights activism. And that was my main reason it wasn't to raise I don't even think I was aware of the vibration idea at the time. I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm still vegetarian because I lost my taste for meat and I have no desire and I love animals and I don't want to eat any. <laughs> so um, that's why I'm vegetarian. It's not a spiritual reason, but that is a big part of the thinking. So your diet, so certain diets sometimes are prescribed. Um, and then uh, meditating. So meditating is supposed to help you raise your vibration. And um, when, my, when I say meditation, I should explain this. Uh, I'm talking about Eastern forms of meditation. And so there's a difference between biblical meditation and meditation the way it's in the culture and the way it's being promoted sometimes even in the church. So the meditation of uh, Eastern meditation and in the culture is a technique. It always involves techniques. So you have to um, usually slow your breathing or breathe a certain way. Um, maybe they'll tell you to dim the lights. You have to sit still. Sometimes you have to sit in a certain kind of way or posture. Um, you do all of this to uh, to get folk kind of focused, but the idea is that you are going to let your thinking mind go. So the whole idea in Eastern meditation is to stop the thinking mind. So you basically want to suspend your thoughts because thoughts are seen as a barrier to understanding spiritual truth. So if you're thinking, then you're not going to be able to understand anything spiritual. So you have to suspend the thinking mind and the techniques of Eastern meditation are designed to do that. That's exactly what they do. 
So this is why Eastern meditation is so dangerous because it's really kind of a form of self-hypnosis. And guided meditation is just as bad. Guided meditation, which I'm now seeing in Christian circles, is a form of hypnosis. It's hypnosis. It's not relaxation. There's a difference between hypnosis and relaxation. They're not the same thing. You can re be relaxed without being hypnotized. Um, so hypnosis is, is going to put your mind in an altered state where you are receptive to anything that wants to come in. So mindfulness does that. You know, Hindu forms of meditation do it like transcendental meditation. Um, and then there's just, there's a lot of different forms of Eastern meditation. Those are probably the two most well-known in this country. <clears throat> and then you have meditation that's taught as stress reduction. And the stress reduction um, techniques are very similar to Eastern meditation. So that can also put you in an altered state. Now, the thing is, is that if you do this, you might feel very peaceful. You might feel really peaceful while you're in that state. And you might feel peaceful when you come out of it. And so you think that it's helping you. See, the, here again, like I said earlier, there's, there's going to be something in it that seems to be beneficial to you. So you're going to think, this is going to help me. Um, so I want to keep doing this. It's helping me. It helped me feel calmer. It helped me feel more peaceful. So I want to keep doing it. See, this is, it has a hook. It always has a hook. And that's just one example. <laughs> so I'm constantly warning against Eastern meditation, guided meditation, stress reduction, guided imagery, all of these things that are happening in the church. Um, there's a whole big movement. This I could probably do a whole talk just on this, the contemplative, um, contemplative spiritual movement, I call it in the church that started with the contemplative prayer movement um, that was started actually by three Trappist monks. But it has spread, it spread through Richard Foster and Dallas Willard. And uh, who actually both of them were friends with Thomas Keating, who was one of the three Trappist monks who started the contemplative prayer movement. I actually heard Thomas Keating speak in person in 2005 at a church here in Northern Virginia. Um, I went with a friend of mine to hear him. I was very aware of him. I had read a couple of books by him and I had written an article um, warning about this kind of uh, contemplation. And I heard him speak, his talk completely verified all of my warnings and then some, I mean, there was even things he said that were, you know, things I didn't know he thought that were even worse. <laughs> so, um, and then he led, he led everybody into a 20 minute session of contemplation. And I can, I, it was like being back in the new age. It honestly was. Now, my friend and I did not participate. We did not participate. Um, but everyone around us was participating and quiet. Some were sitting in like yoga poses. And then when he came out of his, uh, what I'm going to call a trance, uh, his voice was completely different when he came out of it. He, he had definitely been in an altered state. Um, that was a very eye-opening experience. I do have an article on this talk on my website. So if you go to my articles page at ChristianAnswersForTheNewAge.org and you look under, on the left, I have topics and I have things arranged by topic. I have Thomas Keating down there um, under the K, I think. It should be under the K <laughs> um, for his last name. And I have a whole article on that talk and some of the things he said and how he, he, he misused the Bible to support his ideas. Uh, and this is very common. I have found that every person teaching contemplative spirituality misuses scripture. I have yet to see a correct use of scripture. I haven't seen it yet. And I have been doing a lot of reading since the late 1990s on this topic. So we're, we're going back What's the late 1990s? That's over 20 years ago, right? We're going back over 20 years that I've been reading this material and I have yet to see a proper use of scripture. 
So th that should tell you something right there. Now, why am, I, why am I connecting this to the new age? Because the techniques that Thomas Keating and his, the other two monks taught, Basil Pennington, and I read books by Basil Pennington as well. And then uh, the other one is William Menninger. William Menninger is the only one who's alive, who's still alive. And he, as far as I know, he didn't write anything. Basil Pennington and Thomas Keating both wrote books. In their books, they praise Hindu swamis, okay? Um, they think that, you know, Hindu spirituality is, is, I mean, they don't see anything wrong with it. You know, uh, it's, it's great. And you can learn from Hindus and you can learn from Buddhists. Uh, so th this is their attitude. And I'll tell you why I think Thomas Keating has that view. Um, so uh, they accept these, these things. And what Thomas Keating did was he brought some Buddhist monks into the abbey and he had them teach the monks how to do Buddhist meditation. And then he had a former monk who had become an adherent of transcendental meditation come to the abbey and teach transcendental meditation to the monks. And in Thomas Keating's book, um, open, I think it's called Open Heart, Open Mind, he actually talks about the technique of doing a prayer. And it's exactly what I learned for Eastern meditation. It's the same technique. So, you know, I'm reading that and I'm like, He's teaching what I learned for Eastern meditation. Um, and then Richard Foster, who wrote Celebration of Discipline, and I could talk about that too. Um, he and Thomas Keating were friends along with Dallas Willard. Actually, uh, Richard Foster and uh, Dallas Willard, uh, who had this website called, it still exists, called Renovari because uh, Richard Foster's still alive. <clears throat> and they recommended Thomas Keating on their website. Now, Thomas Keating died several years ago, so that connection is gone. But Thomas Keating had a website called Contemplative Outreach, and they, they also did things with Thomas Keating. So they, were, they seemed to be on board with Thomas Keating. I personally think that Thomas Keating is a perennialist. And so I'm going to explain what that is, because this is one of, um, although perennialism isn't strictly New Age, it's very compatible with the New Age, and it's a lot like the New Age. Perennialism is the view that all religions derive from the same source, and they all share the same truth. And so one religion is not more true than another. They're all equally true but they're just different paths for different people. And even though they appear different outwardly, actually internally, they are the same. And there is the same divine spirit or divine reality, which is what they might call God, at the center of the truth. Um, it's kind of hard to get the right words to describe what they, what they mean because they don't, they use words uh, that sound familiar, but they're really meaning something else. And they're very, very, it's very tricky. We actually have a man who's a perennialist whose books are read on Christian college campuses. Um, and I was shocked to find this out because I ran across this guy, David Benner, when I was investigating the Enneagram. And um, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't know who he was and I was curious and I started looking into him and I found out uh, he's a master teacher at Richard Rohr School. Richard Rohr is a big part of this and he is a perennialist, but his books like The Gift of Being Yourself um, and then he has a trilogy, The Gift of Being Yourself and two other books. One is something about how to know the will of God or something and the other one's about love. I can't remember the title of it. I read The Gift of Being Yourself, and I have an article on my website on it. And then I read another book he wrote called Living Wisdom, and that book is just out and out perennialism. I mean, he talks in there about the chakras and being portals for the spirit. And it's, I mean, it's, it's like New Age talk. It's unbelievable. It's just right out there. Um, but I don't think these professors or whoever, Christian counselors who were telling people to read these books, 
are aware, they're obviously not aware of his perennialism and they obviously don't know this book, Living Wisdom, which I also have an article on my website. So this is one of my current concerns. That's why it's popping up here because I have been um, kind of beating the drum on this perennialism for about two years now. I did a number of Facebook posts on it. And then I read the two books by Benner because when I first posted something about David Benner, what happened was I started getting comments from people who said, oh, we had to read that in my college class. We had to read The Gift of Being Yourself. Or my Christian counselor recommended that I read Benner. And then someone told me that he's used in a Christian counseling program at a university. And so this is how I found out that he was being read. I didn't know that. I found out from people telling me. Um, <laughs> So I was like shocked. So that made me even more motivated to warn about him. So I continued investigating him and then finally reading those two books so I could expose him because you cannot be a perennialist and be a Christian. You can't be both because if you're a perennialist, you believe that the true self has always been with God and has never been separated from God. You don't believe that man needs salvation. You don't believe that sin is a problem. You don't believe that you're separated from God by sin. You don't believe that Jesus died on the cross for sins. You don't believe anybody, any, any of that. What you believe in is what David Benner calls in his book, the Christ in me or the Christ self. And I know when Christians are reading that, they're interpreting it by thinking, oh, he just means the regenerated self or the new creation in Christ. That's probably what he means. No, that's not what he means at all. He means that your true self is your Christ self and the Christ self has always been you. And Christ is more of an archetype than anything. This is a, an idea from Richard Rohr as well. So I don't know if I'm have time to talk about Richard Rohr, but, but he's, he's not a new ager, but he's a perennialist and he's a panentheist. Um, and panentheism is a feature of the new age and a lot of his ideas are very compatible with the new age and some of them are the same as the new age so there's an overlap between him i mean he's he, i've never called him a new ager and i always make the distinction you know that he's not but his ideas overlap with the new age so um let's see i kind of this is what happens when i talk i kind of <laughs> kind of get into these avenues that I want to explain, um, I had to kind of go off here and explain perennialism because I think that it's coming into the church. Oh no, I'm not, I don't think it, I know this. It is already coming into the church through contemplative spirituality. A number of um, contemplative, for want of a better term, teachers in the church who are becoming more popular and calling themselves spiritual directors. A lot of them are Enneagram teachers. The Enneagram is all tied in with this as well. Our, per, our perennialists, I suspect them as perennialists. I can't, I can't verify, I can't say 100% they are, but based on what I've read or heard from them, I suspect them to be perennialists. Um, because and a lot of them are admirers of Richard Rohr, so it wouldn't be too surprising if they were perennialists. And these are people that are considered evangelical, or they're speaking in evangelical churches. So um, I also have a friend who's um, who has uh, been a professor at three uh, seminaries. He has a doctorate. Um, you know, he's very scholarly, and he told me that hit one of his fears um, of the Enneagram is that it is bringing perennialism into the church. It's doing it through the contemplative spirituality because there's such a connection. Almost all the Enneagram teachers are into contemplative spirituality. Um, and so there's this kind of tie there and Richard Rohr is part of it too because Richard Rohr started it all because it was his book on the Enneagram that got it into the church. And he is very, very big on contemplation because he says contemplation is unlearning. And he thinks you need to unlearn everything you've learned about Christianity because it's all wrong. 
everything you've learned about Christianity is wrong because you have learned Western Christianity. You haven't learned Eastern Christianity and Christianity that's missed the, the Christianity of the mystics. Okay, this is how Richard War has put it. So the mystics in the Eastern church have had the church truth, whereas the Western church got too rational and logical. And this is just how a new ager talks too. This is exactly how a new ager talks. I'm very familiar with it. You know, Westerners are log logical and they're too logical and rational. So they're, you know, they miss out on true spirituality because um, they're always, they're thinking too much. They use their mind too much. And you know, whenever anything downgrades the mind, it is not of God. It is not of God. Because if you look through scripture, God talks about the mind and using the mind. He talks about reasoning. In fact, reason and logic are based on God's character. They're based on who he is. Logic and reason come from God. They don't come from man. They come from God. And if you really think about it, it makes sense because if you try to deny logic, you're going to you can't do it. You're going to be self-refuting because if you try to deny logic, you have to be logical to do it. You can't, <laughs> you can't deny it. So um, I'm glad I see three people's faces. I wish I saw more faces, but that's okay. It's so weird just to look and see still photos or names, but I'm glad you all are there. Um, but I am looking a lot at the people who, whose uh, faces are live uh, just to get reactions, because I kind of like reactions. Oh, thank you. Oh, a few people turn on their cameras. <laughs> thank you. Um, you know, you can you can turn them off later if you want, but it's nice to see you for a few minutes. So um, is this all making sense to people? I know I'm going to allow an hour. Uh, Jane said to allow an hour for questions. So, um, you know, I'm going to talk a while more and then and then and then uh, allow time for questions. Uh, and I feel like I've just barely gotten started to tell you the truth the, the here again, the new age is so vast. And I, you know what, I started off by saying a while ago, the three areas that the new age came from, remember that? And I said, Gnosticism, and I never moved past that. And look, look what, look what happened. <laughs> I got all the way into perennialism and all this stuff. That's okay. The, the other two areas I've mentioned, well, actually one I haven't mentioned, one I did mention is Eastern spirituality. So Buddhism, Hinduism, and Taoism, those three Eastern religions are huge influences on the New Age uh, to such an extent that a lot of New Agers will be involved with one of those or in kind of the New Age form of it. So, you know, I was very involved in Buddhism and then, you know, you'll find other people influenced by Taoism or Hindu, they're into Hindu meditation, or they may even follow a guru, a Hindu guru, um, but then they'll have new age beliefs. So you find this Eastern spiritual component is very strong in the new age. Not everyone in the new age is in it, but a lot are. And the third component and origin is a movement called new thought and new thought movement is a more recent thing that started mainly in the 1800s and it actually started from spiritualism which was a religion about contact with the dead and a lot of the ideas in spiritualism were picked up by some people who um, used those ideas and combined them with new thought teachings and basically what new new thought is and it's very deceptive because the new thought movement claim to be Christian claim, and claims to be Christian it still exists um, the new thought teaches that Jesus they'll teach about Jesus and about God but they teach that Jesus came to uh, show us that we have wrong perceptions of reality and we need to change our perceptions of reality and this is another idea you'll hear a lot in the new age you always have to you it's always that you're looking at a false reality I mean, this is true in Buddhism and Taoism and Hinduism as well. So the reality that you think is real is not really real. So this is a feature of new age and esoteric philosophies. So you always have to awaken to some kind of truth. And this is, this is uh, just when you hear that kind of talk, then you know you've, you're not in Christianity anymore because <laughs> there's nothing Christian about that. 
um, so you have to awaken to new truths. So in the new thought, Jesus came to tell us that we have never been separated from God and that we actually have a divine nature. So the, they'll use the kingdom of God is within you, one of the most misused scriptures in the Bible. Um, and that's a favorite verse of New Agers. And New Thought uses that to say, well, see, the kingdom of God is within you. That's what Jesus said. So, you know, it's all, it's all within you. You have a divine nature. Um, you were made in the image of God, and they'll take that to mean that you have a divine nature. And they'll say, Jesus realized he was a man. He was just a man like you and me, but he realized his divine nature. And when he realized his divine nature, he attained Christ consciousness. So Christ consciousness is a state of spiritual awareness where you're aware of your divine nature and you're aware of spiritual reality. And so the term Christ consciousness which was first used in New Thought became adopted, it was adopted by the New Age. So the New Age has a lot of the New Thought teachings in it to such an extent that sometimes it's very hard to see the distinction. Like the, if you, you know, I've heard speakers um, that I, I consider kind of New Age and they're talking and most of what they're saying are New Thought ideas. So sometimes I'm not really sure, are they new thought or new age or are they combination? I'll give you an example of one, Oprah. Oprah is a follower of new thought. And a lot of people say she's new age and, and you know, I don't know, based on what I know about her and what I've heard, heard her say and everything for over the years, I would say she is pure new thought. She actually even claims that she was influenced by a book, um, called the, the wisdom, let's say, let me think about discover something about the discover the hidden wisdom in you. I'm not saying it right, but it's by a unity minister named um, Eric Butter, Buttermore, Butterfield. It's by a unity minister who died in 2003. I can remember when he died, I can't remember his last name. She said he, he was uh, influenced her to realize Jesus didn't come to die for sins but Jesus came to die so that we could learn to reach Christ consciousness. And she actually said those words on a show because I happened to be watching her program when, when she said it and I was taping it, which I did. I taped a lot of her programs and I wrote it up in one of my articles on um, Eckhart Tolle, whom she also had. She has a lot of new agers, you know, when she was on TV on her regular program, she had a lot of new agers on her show because being a follower of new thought ideas, she was very open to the new age. So these people, you know, would be on her program um, and their books then would become bestsellers. So a lot of new agers got bestsellers because they were on Oprah's program, um, a lot of them. Uh, and so new thought and new age are very close and the new age took a lot of new thought and I'll give you real quickly, the three main New Thought churches are Unity, which how many, have you heard of Unity before? The Unity Church? And, and by Unity, uh, it's not Unitarian. So just, to, <laughs> some people get them mixed up and, they're, and it's not the Unification Church. So they're, they're all three different. Unity, um, the Church of Religious Science is another one, which is now called the Centers for Spiritual Living. They've changed their name for some reason. And then the third church, I'm sure most of you have heard of, is a Christian science church. All of those churches came out of the New Thought movement. All the founders of those churches were influenced by New Thought, or they were New Thought leaders. And then they founded their own church. Um, and, and here's another way the New Age and New Thought got into the church. Um, Norman Vincent Peale... Um, who maybe you have heard of, maybe not, but he wrote a book called The Power of Positive Thinking that came out in the 1950s. It was, very, it was a humongous bestseller. And he was a minister at a very popular church in New York City, um, the Mar Marble Collegiate Church. And he was an ordained minister, but he was a student of the teachings 
of Ernest Holmes. And Ernest Holmes was a co-founder of the Church of Religious Science. So Peel was actually a student of those teachings. And he took the ideas from Ernest Holmes and they're in his book, The Power of Positive Thinking and other books that he wrote. Um, he spins them with Christian more Christian language so that they sound um, maybe not quite so different. And that got a lot of new thought ideas into the church. And another person who did this was Robert Schuler, who was also studied the teachings of Ernest Holmes. Now, both of those people died um, a while back, Robert Schuler more recently. Um, who had the big crystal cathedral, um, I think in California. I think that's where the crystal cathedral was, yeah. Um, he died more recently. He also had studied Ernest Holmes and used new thought ideas. And so there, these ideas got into the church to such an extent that I remember thinking when I was, when I was going to church as a teenager and I was not a Christian, <laughs> I thought that having positive thinking and and the power of positive thinking was something you're supposed to do as a Christian. I thought, well, that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. You're supposed to be positive about everything. You have to be positive. You have to be, you know, yes, I can do it. That kind of thing. That was all to me, that was Christianity. And I think a lot of people thought that, and I think a lot of people still think it. <laughs> so unfortunately, so new thought has, a, has had unfortunately uh, an influence on the church. Um, and the culture. And it's very big in our culture, really. For example, Tony Robbins, who's a big, um, you know, he's a big uh, self-motivation guy who does these big seminars and, you know, he gets you to believe in yourself and you can do anything. And he, he's, he's a new thought person too. So new thought is very common in American culture because it's all about the individual believing in yourself, you can do anything, et cetera, et cetera. And this is kind of goes along with our culture because it's that pioneer spirit that's a part of the American heritage. But that is not biblical. It's not a biblical outlook on life because <laughs> actually as a Christian, we, we need to depend more and more on Christ. We're supposed to, as we grow in Christian life, become more dependent on Christ, trust him more, depend more on the Lord and less on ourselves. It's the exact opposite of what this culture teaches. So we're very much at odds with this culture, but that thinking is in the church. So, um, okay, so I, I mentioned the three big areas there, which I really wanted to do. Now there's other influences on the new age like theosophy, but um, I'm not gonna go into that at Madame Blavatsky and all of that, but um, those three areas were the main areas I wanted to touch on. And I wanted to give some examples in the church like the contemplative spirituality, the Enneagram, which um, I started warning about on Facebook in 2014 um, when nobody knew what it was. And <laughs> people, I guess, you know, people just didn't know what I was talking about, but I kept warning about it because I saw it in the progressive church. And it got into the progressive church around 2009 or so through Richard Rohr. And Richard Rohr, um, who's very popular with the progressives like Rob Bell and Tony Jones and um, Brian McLaren, who I don't know if all you guys are familiar with, but they were really big back around, you know, 2000, 2000, 2000 to 2008 and even into in the late 90s, they were very popular and they were known as the emergence and they became the progressives. And Richard Rohr and them somehow got together and they're big fans of Richard Rohr. Rob Bell has said Richard Rohr has influenced him for years. And uh, so Richard Rohr has his Enneagram book and you know, the progressives pick up on it. And then what happens is, okay, several years go by and then 2016, Here's The Road Back to You by Suzanne Stabile and Ian Cron. Well, where did that come from? Well, interestingly enough, Suzanne Stabile was mentored for many, many years by Richard Rohr. She is a disciple of Richard Rohr and Ian Cron is a progressive. 
and a crony of Richard Rohr's. Um, so the first book in the church on the Enneagram that was considered evangelical book, and it's still the most popular book, I believe, in the church, um, is written by two disciples of Richard Rohr. And the second book came out the year after by Chris Horitz. He was mentored for many years by Richard Rohr. And on his website for that book, he thanks Richard Rohr and he thanks his Enneagram teachers and he names them, there's three of them, they're all New Agers. Why? Because the Enneagram was in the New Age first, it was in the New Age in the 1980s and the 1990s and, and it still is in the New Age and it's very popular in the New Age because the Enneagram has no standard it has no objective basis. It's not based in truth. It's not based in psychology. It's not based in psychological theories. It doesn't come from studies. It doesn't come from research. It's an ad hoc, it's an ad hoc uh, tool from mainly from men who did spirit contact and from automatic writing. That's where the types come from. It's a pure new age occult tool, 100%. And it's in the church and now I'm seeing pastors become Enneagram coaches and they're teaching other pastors the Enneagram and pastors are doing sermons on the Enneagram like that Matt Brown of Sands Church in Cal in your state California um, well I know Jane said some of you might be from other states so maybe you're not all in California <laughs> but those of you in California maybe you've heard of Sandals no it's Sandals Church that's the name of the church church sandals church and there was a pastor in ohio who did the same thing and other pastors so it's not just there um and i've seen actually seen people in churches recommend richard Rohr. now richard Rohr is completely heretical i'm going to real quickly give you just some of his teachings just so you know i do have an article on his book the universal christ on my website if you go to my articles page and look under book evaluations I have an article on Richard Rohr's Universal Christ under book evaluations. He teaches the first incarnation of Christ was creation. Okay, take that in for a second. <laughs> the first incarnation of Christ was creation. Um, he says that we have never been separated from God. Uh, man has divine DNA because we're all part of creation, so we all have a div we all have divinity in us. This is part of his panentheism. Panentheism is God is in all and all is in God, and that's what Richard Rohr believes. It's not pantheism; it's panentheism. It's a lot more subtle than pantheism. Um, so he teaches that he teaches Jesus did not die for sins. Okay, there was no need for anybody to die for sins because nobody needs salvation because we're already all in Christ, already. Um, and there's a distinction between Jesus and the universal Christ. So there's the Christ and there's Jesus. Uh, this is also something you find in the new age. There's always a distinction between Jesus and, and the Christ. There's, they're not one and the same. Um, and so Richard Rohr teaches this as well. And so uh, the universal Christ is out there, it's sort of a power that's pulling us all towards a point of perfection. And Jesus was, you know, this man back 2000 years ago, um, and he did have the Christ, he was a vehicle for the Christ. So uh, Richard Rohr won't deny that. He won't deny that Jesus was the Christ while Jesus was alive. But, you know, then he says at the resurrection, then the universal Christ sort of was unleashed into creation. So that was the whole point of it was that Christ was in creation, but then he had to come through Jesus to um, get released out into, I'm kind of, what I'm doing is kind of trying to interpret what I've heard Richard Rohr say. I'm not, these are not, I'm not paraphrasing him. I'm just giving you my interpretation, my understanding of his teachings, because I've listened to so many of his talks and interviews over the years. And the idea seems to be that Jesus was this vehicle for the Christ to come into the world. 
And he even uses the illustration of Jesus is holding a kite and the kite is flying up in the air and everybody can see the kite because the kite is way, way up there and everyone in the world can see the kite. Um, and so then they can see the universal Christ, but they can't see Jesus and that's okay. They don't need to see Jesus. But Jesus is not important. So all that's important is that you know the universal Christ. So you can see to call him a heretic is almost an understatement. There's almost nothing he teaches that's in line with historic Christianity. And yet this man is often recommended by pastors and other people. Um, the progressive movement in the church has gotten very strong and there's a very strong progressive movement. Um, and I mean, I feel like I watch it every day and a lot of the people who are being pulled towards this progressive movement have become fans of Richard Rohr. They've been introduced to Richard Rohr and they find him very compelling. Uh, they find his teachings to be very, I don't know, I guess they see his teachings to be true, his teachings to be sort of a breath of fresh air. Um, if they've been disillusioned with Christianity, Richard Rohr seems to have this kind of new Christianity. Um, he has an incredible influence on the church. Okay, so I, um, I will stop. Let me just think a second, make sure that there's nothing else. I mean, I could say more. I, there's always more. You never can finish talking about the New Age because it's sort of endless. It has endless permutations and variations and the alternative healing movements. Another way the new age has gotten into the culture and the church alternative healing is alternative because it's not medical and it's not based on facts and it's mostly based on spiritual beliefs. So, you know, like acupuncture is based on Taoism, for example. Um, and there's just a lot of new age stuff in the alternative healing stuff. And that's another area I've, I've been dealing with a long time. So there's so many aspects of the new age out there. And this is one reason it's difficult to talk about. It's difficult to define. It's difficult to understand. And it's difficult to warn about because it's so vast and because it's so deceptive and you, you just can't cover everything. So I tried to teach some of the basic ideas of it. And I hope that I've, I've conveyed some of that. I've conveyed, um, I probably didn't convey the two basic ideas I should have. One is God is usually seen as an energy, okay? Um, not always, sometimes God is an energy and he's impersonal and personal, okay? Which is contradictory, but in the new age, you can be contradictory because there's different levels of reality. So things look like they're contradictions, but they aren't. This is kind of how you think, how I thought in the new age. So I was okay with contradictory, um, <laughs> contradictory beliefs. Um, so, uh, but usually it's kind of an energy and you draw energy from God. You can draw healing energy from God, like with the Reiki, which is a energy healing or any, a lot of energy healing, all energy healing is, is new age. And Jesus usually is seen as a man who realized his divine nature. Sometimes Jesus is seen as a man on whom the Christ spirit, there's a belief in a Christ spirit that descends on different people at different times of history. And the Christ spirit then descends on somebody and they become like this enlightened teacher. Um, you know, or Jesus was a spiritual master, or Jesus had been reincarnated many times. Um, and, you know, there, there's different teachings about Jesus in the New Age. So those, those are some of the more common. Um, Jesus was an avatar of the age of Pisces. That's what I believed. And I even wrote a three-part article on it for a New Age magazine about the age of Pisces and how it was going into the age of Aquarius and how Jesus was the avatar for the age of, of um, he was avatar for the age of Pisces and how that's fading away now. And so there's this idea with the age of Aquarius that um, the outer teacher becomes the inner teacher. We don't need the outer teachers anymore. We go to the inner teachers within ourselves. 
um, mankind is going to evolve. There's going to be these jumps of evolution in the age of Aquarius because Aquarius is this very innovative um, revolutionary sign. And so people are going to have shifts of, we're gonna have all these shifts of consciousness. So there's even a big humongous, humongous new age website called the Shift Network. If you ever want to just look at a new age website, just go to the Shift, just, just Google the Shift Network or the Shift and you'll, you'll come across it. Um, so there's a lot of stuff on there that's very new agey. So the, all these concepts about the shift and evolving consciousness and going to higher consciousness um, reaching higher consciousness. This is all new age stuff. This is all, all, all new age thinking. And so that those kind of terms and, and phrases that you may hear are coming from new age sources. Okay, I'm gonna, I think I should stop for questions because you know, there's probably a lot of things I haven't addressed that you may be wondering about. All right, who wants to ask the first question, just unmute yourself. So yeah, everyone to... always takes a long time to figure out their questions. So I will uh, just jump in and say I really appreciate this. You know, I I remember back when I was doing youth ministry stuff in the uh, 90s and going through a lot of these conversations, had whole studies on a lot of these topics that you dealt with. My wife had a mom's group and we had some uh, material for that put together on the Oprah stuff. Um, and so I just want to affirm from my own experience uh, which is not as vast as yours <laughs> uh, and just your big involvement with that but just uh i resonate with so much you say about one thing people think you know the the tentacles of what you're talking about stretch into a lot of other places too um areas of theistic evolution into transhumanism a lot of the principles talking about a lot of the views of god you know what it is the human <clears throat> has Kind of work their way in to these different theories and ideas and so it's, uh, it's difficult to wrap but so i think what you're providing here for is to be extremely useful and even if they're not talking about a purely religious context but even within christianity i'm having joe i'm having a hard time understanding you like your words are not real clear I, it's a, something with the sound i'm having a hard time spiritual battle like, I'm not sure I'm, I'm totally understanding everything you're saying. I got, oops, I got like a little bit okay. of it. Uh, well, is that any better? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Yeah, much better. I won't repeat everything. I just want to say I affirm really what you're talking about. And the tentacles of all this stuff you're reaching into are, if, you know, if anyone is studying things like theistic evolution or transhumanism, um, it goes into those areas quite a bit, um, especially panentheism, process theology, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talking about is relevant to a lot of things. So even if people aren't really, you know, into, oh, I don't, what is new age? That's not, not relevant to me or whatever. There's a ton of areas uh, that could be touched on that I think what you're saying is very relevant. So I just wanted to affirm that and just appreciate your talk and your experience and expertise. Thank you so much. And I'm glad you said that because I did want to say a lot of people will say, oh, the new age is just, it's not here anymore. I think several years ago, someone said, oh, the new age is just, you know, some Christians said the new age has just faded away. It's not around anymore. And it's actually around more than ever. The, the, the reason people think it's gone is that it has, it has mainstreamed. And so, and it's merged with other things, with sports, you know, with 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 healthcare, um, with uh, I don't know education, with all all kinds of areas, and so people think it's gone when it's actually merged, and it's been so slow, it's kind of inched its way in that people aren't aware of it, and because they don't really know what it is, they they don't recognize it. So I, I appreciate what you said, Joe. Thank you. Somebody else got to have a question, I'm sure. <laughs> Um, so the Enneagram is super popular, and how do you approach Christians saying this is not something a Christian should be using as a tool? Yeah, that's and that's that can be really hard to, especially if the person's been using it and they really say that's another thing. You'll hear people say, "Oh, it really helped me," 
you know, it helped me in my, my, it helped my marriage or, you know, it really helped me understand myself or something like that. Um, yeah, this, and the thing is the way I usually answer that is I say, but you know, all of my astrological clients told me astrology helped them. All of them said it helped them, even some who were skeptical at the beginning. Um, you can ask, there's thousands of people around um, the planet who believe in astrology and will tell you that it helps them, that it guides their, you know, guides them. They use it for, a, maybe some of them use it for a daily guidance. Uh, it's very easy to believe something is helpful and something is true because of, of, of confirmation bias. Um, there's something called um, something validation. It's a self-validation or something where you make connections between something uh, that you think are there to validate it. And uh, there's the Barnum, uh, Barnum theory, which is that general descriptions will fit a lot of people, but when you're reading it, it seems very specific to you. So in, in fact, the Enneagram works the same way astrology works works exactly the same way in terms of how people believe it and why people believe it. What I usually, um, you know, it depends on the situation and if the person's asking me a question or if they're just challenging me, which is usually more like it, <laughs> uh, or arguing with me, I usually say, do you, do you realize that there is no um, psychological basis for the Enneagram, that this did not come from any psychological group or psychology or psychological study. Um, sometimes even if you say that though, they'll say, well, I, you know, I don't care because it helped me or something, you know, and I, you know, I want to say if this is supposed to be a way to understand yourself, shouldn't it be based on something? It should be based on something objective. It should be based on theories or it should be based on studies or research. And of course it's not, it's not based on any of that. So I try to point out that it's not valid. It's not, it's not seen as valid in the professional world of psychology at all. And um, when you find psychologists or psychotherapists who use it, they're usually new agers or they're progressives or they're, or they're people like Ian Cron, who's you know, a psychiatrist, but who's a, an ally of uh, Richard Rohr. So they're spiritually deceived. Um, so I usually try to point out it's invalid. And then I try to talk about how, uh, what it comes from mainly are two men who did spirit contact. I mean, the Enneagram existed first just as a diagram of um, what George Gurdjieff called uh, cosmic reality. George Gurdjieff lived um, like from the late 18, he lived from the 1800s into the 20th century. And he was a spiritual seeker and had all these spiritual ideas and he had followers and students. And he came up with a diagram of the Enneagram. And he said that all reality could fit into this diagram. And then it was used um, for teaching people how to awaken to what he called the new man, because here again, you have to awaken to the, the true reality. But it had nothing to do with the nine, there was no nine types and there was no find your what number are you or anything like that. So that was how it was until um, for a long time. Um, and his student Uspensky wrote, actually Gurdjieff never wrote about the Enneagram, his student Uspensky wrote about it. Um, and these are very esoteric teachings. Uh, there's still people in the world who are followers of Gurdjieff and Uspensky. Um, there's a lot of cults that follow these teachings around the world. They still exist. Um, and then, um, so it was like that for a long time and nobody knew about the Enneagram except people who followed Gurdjieff or Uspensky. And then in the 1960s, um, this man named Oscar Chazo came across some followers of Gurdjieff. He found out about the Enneagram and Oscar Chazo uh, had an occult school in Arica, Chile. And he had his secret teachings there. When you came to the school, you had to sign a form that said you would not reveal anything that was taught at that school. It was all secret, you couldn't reveal anything. 
And at that school, he taught the Enneagram. But the way he taught was, he taught as nine ego fixations. And so the ego fixations are the false construct of the self that hide the true essence. And your true essence is pure and untouched by anything evil or bad or anything. It's like, it's divine. It's the pure, uh, the pure self, the true self untouched by anything. And so that has been covered up. You know, you come into the world pure, but then you have experiences, you have people tell you things or teach you things. And all of that starts to become a layer over the pure self that hides this true self. And you have to figure out, you know, that you have to understand this layer is not you and it comes from fear and false beliefs. And then you pick away at that so you can see your true self. So that was how he taught it. Now he took the seven deadly sins and he added two more to, to make it nine because there were nine points. So there had to be nine. So he added two more that were not deadly sins and he had to add them. So there had to be nine deadly sins. Now, why would he do that? Well, it's not because he was a Christian or he believed in sin. It's because it was a tool that he could use. And this is very, very common in the occult that you will see the use of Christian terms, the use of Jesus, the use of the Bible it is very common to see this in the occult. It is not unusual at all. Um, and so that he used some terms like that could also be because he's where is he? He's Bolivian and he's in Chile. What are these two countries? They're heavily Roman Catholic countries, right? So probably most of the students coming have Catholic backgrounds. So they're going to resonate with the deadly sins. So I'm not, I, I don't know if that's why he did it, but I think that's a pretty good guess. <laughs> and plus that was his background too. So it's just, it's, it's a way for him to present his ideas and he does it with these deadly sins but he didn't believe in sin he didn't believe in in you needing to you know have your sins forgiven or anything like that he was in no way even close to being a christian so he's an occult teacher he has a student named claudio naranjo who comes there now claudio naranjo is a psychiatrist from chile he is spiritually he's on a spiritual journey he's seeking answers to life. He comes to um, Ichazo school. He learns the Enneagram from Ichazo. Um, by the way, Naranjo's specialty as a psychiatrist was investigating and researching hallucinogen drugs, hallucinogenic drugs. And he himself and Ichazo would take drugs for spiritual trips. Now, all of you, I think, are too young to remember the 60s, but this is what happened in the 60s. People took drugs for spiritual trips, LSD and mescaline and other drugs and into the 70s. So you took a drug and it was like to have, for many of them, it was not everybody, but for many people, it was to have a spiritual trip. And so that's what that's what Naranjo and Ichazo did. Ichazo also claimed that um, he had contact with two spirits, Metatron, and another one called the Green Ketub. Now, the Green Ketub is somehow associated with Sufism. Um, and Metatron is an archangel in the Kabbalah. And Oscar Chazza in Kabbalah. Now, the Kabbalah is a very Gnostic. It's a very, very Gnostic system. There's nothing biblical about it. It's like Gnostic Judaism is what it is. And it's not ancient either. It came about around the 13th century. It just claims to be ancient, but it's not ancient. Um, so he had studied the Kabbalah. So Metatron was one of the spirits. And then he said that his group there at the school was by an interior master. Well, that means they had a spirit guy. No, no big surprise to me. So Naranjo goes there. He learns the Enneagram. He goes off to California. California again. <laughs> Esalen in Big Sur, which is still there, was a hotbed of early new age and experimental psychology thinking. It was a very, very edgy place. Um, 
it's it was not like a sanitized research facility. Um, my friend, Dr. Ronald Huggins, who I mentioned earlier, who's taught at three seminaries and who helped research with our book. Oh, by the way, I have a whole book. We have a whole book on this, Richard Rohr and Enneagram Secret. So um, that will give you everything you need to know about the Enneagram and a lot about Richard Rohr. Um, he said that Esalen was a place where people were more likely to do LSD, get naked, and do drumming. That was pretty much <laughs> pretty much sums up Esalen. <laughs> so you had all these spiritual type teachers and 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 edgy psychologists gathering there for classes, and it was a very like, you know, I I can kind of imagine what it was like. I mean, I you know I just really can. Having been in the New Age, I, I have a good idea of it. Some stories I've heard. And he was there and he started teaching the Enneagram there at Esalen. And there was a Jesuit named Bob Oaks who was there. And he and the Jesuit, this Jesuit learned the Enneagram and took it to a seminary, Loyola Seminary in Chicago. And that's how it got into the, the cat. It didn't really get into the Catholic Church. It got used by some Jesuits and at some retreat centers. The Catholic Church never endorsed or approved of the Enneagram. Uh, and so it was being taught by Catholics. And at the same time, it went to Helen Palmer, who was a psychic. And Helen Palmer was the first New Ager to really take the Enneagram up and learn it and teach it and write on it. And she just, I mean, she kind of made the Enneagram a big deal in the New Age. I mean, she was the one who introduced it She's still around and she, you can go on YouTube, just put Helen Palmer in YouTube search box. If you wanna hear a new age, a new ager talk, just listen to her for five minutes. She's like pure, pure, pure new age. Um, but she will sound very profound because she uses a lot of psychological language. Um, and my co-authors and I are still trying to investigate if the degrees she has claimed are actually real degrees because we're not sure she really got those degrees we don't know but helen palmer now she doesn't call herself a psychic anymore she presents herself as a kind of wise a kind of like a therapist or a counselor or something she doesn't use the word psychic but that's what she was i remember her when i was in the new age i knew who helen palmer was i knew she was a psychic so it's really funny for me now to listen to her Chris Horace, who wrote the Sacred Enneagram, Helen Palmer was one of his teachers. He loves Helen Palmer. He had her on his podcast about the Enneagram. And when he, on twi Twitter, he wrote, "My net, I just dropped my um, podcast interview of Helen Palmer. Uh, you're welcome. That's what he wrote. And then I listened to the interview and he said at the beginning, he's so excited to have her. He's like practically falling all over himself. This is, he's supposed to be a Christian. <laughs> he's supposed to be a Christian, Chris Horitz. Um, I think he's a perennialist and I think his wife is a perennialist as well, Philena. And they're both very close associates of Richard Rohr. So he loves Helen Palmer. Richard Rohr loves Helen Palmer. Helen Palmer has an endorsement from Richard Rohr on her website. Richard Rohr actually has an endorsement of Helen Palmer. So there you go. I mean, uh, the book, uh, The Road Back to You, the first book, and The Road Between Us by Suzanne Stabile, towards the back of each book, they thank people who contributed to the Enneagram. Each book has the name of 13 New Agers in it. And then uh, uh, both of those books are from IVP, InterVarsity Press. InterVarsity Press came out with a book called Spiritual Rhythms for the Enneagram. I did a Facebook post on it. Um, and it has a whole section called Gratitudes. And they thank a whole bunch of people there. And there's a whole bunch of New Agers there. I forgot how many. Uh, I'm thinking 17, but I could be wrong. So don't quote me on that. But there was a whole bunch there, uh, New Agers that they thank. Um, there's a false history with the Enneagram because everyone's saying it's ancient and this fourth century monk named Evagoras Ponticus 
used it, or they'll say this uh, 12th century guy named Ramon Lull, this monk in Spain used it. And they'll even show this diagram and they'll say that that was like his Enneagram. Well, no, it's a diagram of God's attributes. That's what it is. And um, he had nothing to do. There was no Enneagram in existence until 1916, 105 years ago. And even then that was, didn't have anything to do with the types. And I forgot the most important part, which is Claudio Naranjo came up with, he came up with the word types and he came up with the nine types. And the way that they're used now came from Claudio Naranjo and he claims he got that information from automatic writing. So automatic writing is spirit contact. It's a form of spirit contact, which, you know, he thinks is great. He talks about his higher authorities that he gets information from. So the nine types come from automatic writing. They come from spirits. So there you have the Enneagram. You've got spirit information from, and who are these spirits? Well, they're fallen angels. Just to make that clear, they're fallen angels. So we've got information from fallen angels in the church. We've got over 30 books now on the Enneagram in the church. We've got pastors teaching it. We've got promoting it. Enneagram coaches. I, I can't believe it. I mean, really, it's hard for me to see this because this is what God delivered me out of. And I mean, I did spirit contact. I had spirit guides. This is about as evil as you can get. You know, when you have information from spirit spirits in the church, I don't know that you can get more evil than that, to tell you the truth. <laughs> And you have, and you can see the effects of it because what happens with people who get into the Enneagram is they get totally caught up in themselves. They begin to justify or rationalize things based on their type. Well, I did that because I'm a seven, you know, and that's, you know, that's, that's, that's what I do. I'm a seven or I can't, I can't do that. That wouldn't, that would be hard for me to do because I'm a four. And I hear this from Christians. Christians tell me this is what they hear in their church. So um, it's self-focused. It's also bringing in a false theology from Richard Rohr. So you've got that going on and it's bringing endorsements of, of Richard Rohr. And it's just, it's just become a tool of Satan in the church. Um, so I, I really, you know, I really mean that when I say that. I'm not exaggerating and I'm not trying to be dramatic. I never try to be dramatic because I think the occult is dramatic enough as it is. <laughs> and the occult and the new age, okay, I do make a distinction between them. They're not the same thing, but there's a lot of overlap. And the new age uses a lot of occult um, ideas and, and practices. So there's a lot of overlap, um, like having spirit guides in the new age. That's really an occult thing to have spirit guides, but a lot of new agers have spirit guides. Astrology is an occult art, but you know, I was, I was a new ager. So there's a lot of, there's just a lot of mixture there with the new age and the occult. So the Enneagram is, um, you know, there's our book, Richard Warren, the Enneagram Secret. And then there's the 30 plus books <laughs> from IVP, Thomas Nelson, Zondervan. We now have Enneagram devotionals where you can get a devotional just for your type. So if you're type five, you get the Enneagram for type five, the devotional for type five. Um, there's prayers. Now you can have a prayer if you're type seven. Here's some prayers for you as type seven. Um, uh, it's just unbelievable. It's really, it's almost surreal to me. It's almost like something somebody thought up in a bad dream. Except it's, except it's reality. <laughs> so, well, now you can you can see why um, I've been warning about the Enneagram. And um, I, my first article was actually in 2011. My first article on the Enneagram was on my website. It's called the Enneagram GPS Gnostic Path to the Self. And that was the name of my article. And at that time, I mean, hardly anybody noticed it at all because, you know, <laughs> It was in the progressive church, but most evangelical Christians or non-progressive Christians didn't know about it, of course. So it just kind of sat there. Um, but anyway, so 
question, there's got to be other questions. You've got to wonder something or anything about anything I said. Do you have questions on anything I said? Yeah, so I think I'm, I have questions and then up next is Daniel and Caitlin. Okay. Um, but uh, you kind of answered a lot of my questions, which is great. I um, oh, really good. appreciated that. So thank you. Oh, um, I think, I think um, I'm trying to decide if I just want to punt it off to Daniel and Caitlin, but I think I would love to ask, like, I've, um, my parents are, are um, very sensitive to the spiritual world and they've always been very like, uncomfortable with certain things that a lot of my church friends were always like so okay with like Halloween to them was like like they stayed away from a lot of things and I was like but like other Christian people do these things over here um and so one question I have for you as somebody who's like who has interacted in the spirit world and in new age with like spirit contact and all of those things as um like how how does it affect somebody who is ignorant that that's what they're doing? Like if they don't know that they're contacting spirits and they don't know, like I think a lot of people who are Christians and a lot of young people who are like interacting with the Enneagram, like see it as like Myers-Briggs. Like they don't even know that it has implications yeah. and they might not even make it self-centered for them. They just might be like, oh, this is a way my friends talk about their introversion, you know, mm -hmm. and that's fine. But like, is there, is there a danger for that person or is it very contextual to like the person's heart or um, how they're interacting with the information or if they want something from the information and like, how does, like, how does the spirit world interact with people who are kind of more ignorant of the situation, I guess is my question. And I don't okay. know if that's when you can answer. No, no, it's no, I, 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 I think I understand what you're asking. And um, okay, I would say, first of all, just to make it clear, I don't think using Enneagram means that you're doing spirit contact. Okay, if you use a Ouija board, yeah, then you, you may have spirit contact. Um, and so that would be more a direct way of doing spirit contact, or you go to a medium who says they'll call up, you know, your dead grandfather or something. Um, so they're, what they're using is the Enneagram is like a result of spirit contact. So the information and the way that it operates in the church to undermine, um, in my view, undermine sound doctrine and undermine uh, the place of, the, actually, I see it as taking pl the place of the Bible and the Holy Spirit. That's how I see it operating. So my, I see it in a big broad view way of how it's affecting the church. And then as far as individuals, I think it's, it's hard to say it's going to depend a lot on the person. I think if the person is not real grounded in scripture or they're a young or, or they're an immature believer, that it may trip them up in, in different ways. Like it may get them more self-focused. They may get interested in Richard Rohr. Okay, I've had a few Christians tell me that when they were reading Enneagram books that mentioned Richard Rohr, they got interested in him and they started reading him, not understanding how heretical he was. And they started getting into his ideas only to discover, wow, oh, <laughs> so that's, that's what he believes. And then, then, they, then there was kind of this unraveling because they felt uh, betrayed. They felt uh, they had made this horrible misstep and this mistake and kind of like, where did I go wrong? They started questioning their discernment, et cetera, et cetera. So it did a lot of damage that way. Um, some people may actually get into war and find him interesting and continue to pursue it. Um, so I think it depends a lot on the person. So I try not to say, I can't predict or even say how it's damaging an individual unless I'm talking to that person or, or, or they've told me how it's affected them. And I have had Christians tell me how it's misled them and affected them. Um, there's a, a pastor's wife. Well, she was a pastor's wife when she got into the Enneagram. She did a, I did a program with her on Doreen Virtue's channel. Uh, Doreen Virtue was really big in the new age. She was huge. Um, she did angel books, angel contact. And now she's a Christian. And this woman, um, Jill Lancour, uh, 
got into the Enneagram and she got the women and she was the pastor's wife. So she got the other women into it. And she said it got to where it was all about, everything was about the Enneagram. It was like, now I have to know what my children's types are, you know, and I have to know my husband's type and, oh, your husband's type is a four. Oh, my husband is a, is a four too. You know, she said it became, that's, she said, that's what they talked about. It, it like overrode the Bible. The Bible of scripture kind of took second place. So I, I hear this from people too. So I see that as a possible danger. I think that the way that I look at it is that since I know the Enneagram is false and it's mainly a result of, um, of spirit contact and it's a new age tool. And the whole idea of it is not that you are a seven or you are a nine. The idea is that you have the seven type and that hides your true self. Even Chris Horitz teaches this. He says that the Enneagram are nine paths back to God. And so whichever type you are, you have to figure out how that's hiding the true self. And he'll talk, he talks about the true self and the essence. Um, and that's who you, that's what you're supposed to discover with the Enneagram. That's the purpose of it. It's not to discover your personality type. That's not, that's not the purpose of it. And see a lot of the, a lot of the ways it's being spun in the church is that this is like a personality assessment and that's not what it is at all. It's to uncover the true essence of who you are, the true self. So I also try to make that point when I'm talking to Christians about it. And if you try to use it the other way, well, you're, you're not using it the way it was designed. It's not like, it's not Myers-Briggs, which is supposed to be about, and I'm not saying it's valid because it's not really valid, but <laughs> it's not considered valid by psychologists either. They don't think any personality test is valid. They're, they're just, you know, they're, Jordan Peterson talks about the big five uh, groupings of personality traits, and he's come up with a test so you can see, I think, which grouping you're in. But he even has a lot of reservations about it. Um, so Myers-Briggs isn't even really valid, but at least it's not a spiritual tool. It's not making spiritual claims like the Enneagram. So the fact that the Enneagram is making spiritual claims and has this hidden agenda in it is why I see it as dangerous. And I think it can damage some people in different ways. I don't know if I answered your question. Did I answer it? Good. Okay. Yeah, no, that was very helpful. Okay, good, good. I'm glad, Sarah. Okay, I think what Daniel had a question. Yeah, so my question was kind of random. It's just, you mentioned Dallas Willard and I'd never heard anything negative about him. Yeah. I don't know a lot about him. Like I haven't read his books or anything, but I have a friend who likes him and I, everything he said, it didn't seem wrong. So I guess I just wondered, is that something you would bring up, like to be wary of him or? Yes, I, you know, I think that probably in his younger years, he was very much um, more in, in line with basic traditional historic Christianity, but I think that he veered off later and he got into, he really got into mysticism. Um, he, there's a couple of very good on, articles online about him that, that I would have to send you the links to because I, I can't think of the names of the articles or the writers where they really go into more detail because I don't feel like I'm an expert on him. I mainly know him from his association with Richard Gloucester and Thomas Keating and the fact that he was endorsing uh, these ideas from contemplative spirituality, which I see as contrary to the historic faith and contrary to sound doctrine. So um, I think he became very experience oriented. Now I read part of his book, um, The Spirit, Spirit of the Disciplines, I think is the title. I found it extremely spiritually heavy and confusing. It was very, it was just heavy. And it was like spiritually and emotionally and psychologically and mentally heavy. 
and he he seems to talk about the yoke of Jesus as the disciplines. And I'm like, what? What? He gets into this idea of the disciplines. Now, spiritual disciplines is a term from medieval monasticism. It's what the monks did. Why are we doing something taught in the 13th century to monks? You know, I, and I don't see scripture for it. Now, people say, oh, well, prayers are just, yeah, we are supposed to pray. Now, it depends on how you're going to define discipline as to whether you want to call it a discipline or not. But, you know, it's fine to be disciplined in your, in your life as a Christian. But I don't think there has to be a system set up for it that you're supposed to follow. I think that's what bothers me. And people say, well, here's this discipline, this discipline, this discipline, and, and this is what you do. And um, <clears throat> I, uh, I find it kind of legalistic and burdensome because mm -hmm. I feel like if you're studying and, and reading scripture and you're, you know, hearing good sermons and you're praying and everything like that, and you're just living the day-to-day -day normative Christian life and striving to yield to the Holy Spirit, that's all going to work itself out. You don't need to follow some kind of program. So I, I think that that's one of the things that bothers me. And that it's, be, it's become, it's been made such a thing in the church now. It's become very popular so that, like you said, you and I have never heard anything negative against Dallas Willard. I can yeah. tell you anytime I, I voiced any question about him, people like looked at me and like I was <laughs> kind of like, what is your problem? <laughs> you know, yeah. like how you, how can you criticize him? And, and, and that's, that's the reaction you get. Uh, even with Richard Foster who, uh, by the way, I was going to say something about him. He was mentored by Agnes Sanford. Agnes Sanford had been a follower of New Thought. And I don't think she ever left it. She married an Episcopal priest um, and supposedly, I guess, became technically or officially became Episcopalian. But I don't know if her, if her beliefs ever made the shift because I've read two books by her. Um, and I... I read a book about her and I don't see Christian theology in there. Mainly I see new thought. And in fact, in, in um, Richard Foster's book, Celebration of Discipline, when he, especially his chapter on prayer, he actually suggests some new thought techniques like um, visualizing a white light or visualizing somebody well. He also says, if you're praying for somebody to be healed, don't ask for God's will. That's straight out of new thought. That's straight out of new thought. And he had to have learned that from Agnes Sanford. So I've actually did a big warning post on him on Facebook. I don't, it's not on my website. I have a lot of the stuff that I'm talking about is on Facebook. Um, they're post Facebook posts. So I did one on Richard Foster as the student of Agnes Sanford and it's called The Little God of Richard Foster. And it's about the new thought ideas that I saw in Celebration of Discipline. And so I'm appalled that that book is so popular in the church. And I'm not afraid to speak out on it because this is what God delivered me from. So I'm not going, I don't think God wants me to be silent. That's why I'm in this ministry. God doesn't want me to be silent on this. I, I need to say things with love, but I need to say them, you know? So I've, I have spoken out. Did I answer your question? Yeah, I, yeah, I think you did. Um, but what would be the best way to contact you about? Um, okay, you can contact me um, on, on Facebook and go to Christian Answers for the New Age and contact me there. Also, I will give my email okay. to you guys. Um, it's, <laughs> it's, it's such a long email. It's the, T-H-E-X-E-X, -E -X, astrologer. <laughs> it's the X astrologer at gmail.com. So it's T-H-E-E-X-A-S-T-R-O-L-O-G-E-R -E -E at gmail.com. So there's two E's together there at the beginning, um, which sometimes people miss because, you know, you just put the T H E and you think you've got it, but you got to put the other E there. So the X astrologer at gmail.com. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
somebody else you said had a question, I think. Was it Caitlin? Yep, that was me. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you for your talk. It's definitely great to hear someone who came out of the movement and like with astrology and everything. Um, it was interesting for me as in, as like a physics major. I've had three, my, I had a study group with three other physics majors, most of whom were also double majoring in astronomy. All of them talking about astrology as well. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so about astrology too? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and so, yep, it's even making it into like the hard sciences, people that are majoring in astronomy also following astrology. Oh my so, goodness, wow. Yep. So, wow, yep. I'm surprised, wow. Yeah, uh, I was too, but. Yeah, <laughs> I really you think sure. astronomy would realize, you know, this is a science because astronomers have been the enemies of astrologers for a long time. I mean, they mm -hmm. have, they really constantly we used to get in Atlanta, the Astrological Society would get invitations from the astronomical people there, the Astronomical Society, inviting us to do debates with them. Because <laughs> they're like, yeah, come on, bring it on, astrologer. <laughs> you know, we're going right. to like, you know, completely smash you in the debate. You know, none of us ever did it, but they were always like, you know, trying to get us to, to agree to a debate or something. So mm -hmm. anyway, okay, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so I think my main question is just, um, especially with the new age or with Eastern religions, I've always struggled like how to basically just even talk about truth when um, with the Eastern religions, the law of non-contradiction doesn't necessarily apply. Uh, yeah. risk so that would argue and I'm not sure like th that's just such a fundamental thing I'm not sure where to even start with talking yeah. with people yeah it, it's very hard um and and if you're talking to new agers about what is truth um it is very hard because they don't believe in in objective truth so you know so where do you where do you go from there it's like there's nowhere to go I usually try I usually try to ask them about, do you believe in objective truth? And then they'll say no, usually. And I'll say, well, if, if there's no truth, a standard for truth, then how do you know what's true and false? Okay, what? then how do you make a distinction? How can you say anything is false if, if you don't have some truth to measure it by? Um, I mean, that's one approach. Uh, but the, the thing about the Eastern religions, their purpose is not what, what is truth, it's what is reality. So what is ultimate reality? And that's the, that's the main issue of like Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism. And so to them, truth is not really, doesn't really come into it. It's more like what is ultimate reality? And we're all like blinded to that. That's, that's all been hidden. Um, so it is a hard question. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on dealing with people in like raised in Eastern religions as their religion. I'm more, I'm more experienced with New Agers who have adopted Eastern religions. But the idea of what is truth is the same thing with the New Age because there's no absolute truth. So I just, I try to go that way or I try to ask them, um, how do you know uh, if something's true? I mean, just just tell me, how do you know? Now, a lot of times they'll say, well, it, if, I, if it works for me, it's true. And that's pretty much where they're coming from. It's kind of like truth is my experience. Whatever my experience is, is true. And so you can't really argue it because everything's so subjective in the new age that if you try to approach it in kind of a logical way with them, you, you usually don't get anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so you have to find ways around it. Like um, I try to show what the consequences of their ideas are. So for example, I had, um, when I did my article on um, Conversations with God by Neil Donald Walsh, which came out a number of years ago. Um, I think it's still popular, but it was, but it was such a popular book that people were actually had little study groups in their homes and they were using Neil Donald Walsh's Conversations with God. And so I have, a, I have some articles on my website on that book and on his book, um, Friendship, I think it's called Friendship with God. And then he did a Conversations with God for Teens. 
oh my gosh, that was really dreadful. And so people would write me, people who liked Neil Donald Walsh, and they would say, you really need to read this book again. You know, you're not, you didn't read it carefully because of what you said. And, uh, and, they, and they were just like kind of be mad at me for what I said. And, and, and uh, how can you say that, that this is such a bad book? And I would say, okay, well, look, God tells Neil Donald Walsh that there's no such thing as right or wrong. Because that's what God says in, you know, in his book. That the God that Neil Donald Walsh says he talked to. Um, so I said, okay, so if there's no such thing as right or wrong, then are you willing to let everybody out of the prisons? Like, how about all the people that are in prison for murder? Should we just open the prison doors and let them out? I mean, is that okay with you? I mean, see, I just, I want them to see the consequence of this idea. If there is no such thing as right or wrong, then let's, let's take that and let's put it in action. Okay. Is somebody steals your car? Is that, is that okay? Are you going to call the police? You know? You bring it kind of, you kind of have to bring it down to earth with them. Um, and you can get a con, you can't, you might just make them mad, but you might get them to thinking too. Right. So like if, if they are, us are mainly focused on from like an Eastern perspective, like what is ultimate reality? We could ask like, could you be wrong about what ultimate reality is? Or if there's multiple layers to what ultimate reality is, then, um, does it matter if I steal your wall? <laughs> like, yeah, 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 or yeah. You could say that, and you and you could say, well, how will you know that it's reality when you find it? What if you don't know what mm -hmm. it is, or we don't know what it is? Then how are we going to know what it is when we find? It? How are we going to recognize mm -hmm. it? Um, right. And why is it that we don't know what it is? You know, just ask like really basic questions about it, because a lot of times, and I know this was true for me in the New Age. I didn't think these things through you know and I for example I believed in reincarnation and I thought eventually you know you spiritually progress and progress and eventually you don't come back anymore okay and you kind of merge with the god force or the god energy and you lose your individuality which actually to me was not a very comforting thought that I would lose you know my individuality but I figured, well, when I get there, you know, I'll be advanced enough that they'll be okay. <laughs> and so, um, but, but I also did not really have a, a, a clear idea of, well, who's going to decide when I get there? How many lives? Okay, so I die and then I go somewhere. Who's, is somebody telling me that I have to come back or do I decide to have to come back? And how many lives am I going to have to live? And at what point will I not have to come back? So I have asked New Agers that question now who believe in reincarnation. So I'll ask them, well, how, how many more lives do you have? And, and how will you know that you don't have to come back? And is somebody going to tell you that? Is someone else deciding or are you deciding? You know, how is it operating? And when you don't come back anymore, where will you be? You know, I, and try to get, I try to get real practical with them. And, and to get them to think these things through because um, they, they often don't. Oh, I wanna recommend for you and, and really anybody, if you all don't know about it, you probably do know about it though, the book Tactics by Greg Kukul. Yes, just read it. Oh, you did? Yeah. Well, use some of his approaches, some of his questions you can apply to anybody. So you can apply to New Agers, to people, to Buddhists, to Hindus. Um, I think his book is very helpful. Um, and so you, he gives you good ideas of questions that you can ask, you know, well, why do you think that? And um, what makes you think that is true? And that kind of question, they're very kind of open-ended questions. So the person doesn't feel, you know, attacked like you're challenging them, but it's making, it's having, it's causing them to have to come up. They're going to have to think to come up with an answer, or maybe they'll just think through what they believe more. So I don't know if I helped you or not, Caitlin. That's because that's a hard one. I admit mm -hmm. that's a that's one of the most difficult things I think to discuss with with a new age or somebody into Eastern religion, asking them about truth. Now I will tell you a, to an example that's similar is that I one time asked um, I was giving a talk at a college in Maryland and the um, sponsored by University 
and they had invited the pagan uh, student union to come <laughs> and the pagans were all there and um, and some others and Christians and, uh, and the president of the pagan union actually was there with a group of them. And so I was, my talk was the, um, uh, the distortions or maybe not the distortions, the wrong thinking of what Christianity is and the wrong thinking of what um, uh, paganism and neo-paganism is. But so at one point I asked them, I asked them, uh, okay, do you believe in do what you will, but do no harm? And they said, yes, because that's like the motto for Wiccans and witches mm -hmm. anyway. So I said, do you believe that? And they said, yes. And I said, how do you determine what harm is? Well, one of them said, well, you just don't want to hurt anybody physically, mentally, or, or spiritually. And I said, yeah, but how do you know? How do you know if you've hurt them? Uh, mentally or spiritually. I said, what's the standard there? Um, what's it based on? They, they, had no, they had no answer. I said, what if you don't intend to hurt somebody, but you do? Have you harmed them? And then I gave them an example. I said, what if you were in India and you were in a little town in India where they still practice widow burning and they throw the widow on the funeral pyre of her husband? I said, um, would that be okay with you? And they were like, no, no, that's not okay. And I said, but who are you to tell them that that's not okay? Because they think it's okay. In the traditional Hindu view that the British tried to stamp out, but I heard it's still done in some remote areas. I said, well, <laughs> I said, who are you to say that's wrong? You shouldn't do that if they think it's a spiritual thing. Well, they don't have an answer because there's no, they don't have any absolute standards for anything. So they may think they can deal with it here or in their practice, but then you go to India or somewhere else where something's happening, they think it's horrible. Then they find if they're going to apply their standard everywhere, they can't say anything to the Hindus. So you, so you kind of do, you kind of do things like that to get people to look at things a different way maybe bring up a situation or something and ask them what they would do in that situation. Well, I guess that my time is up. Yeah, it looks like we're out of time. So I guess that's the last question. Thank you so much, Marsha. That was a lot of information. <laughs> yeah. And I, you know, I'm sorry that sometimes it may have seemed I was kind of all over the place. I was really following a trail, but I know I, there's really such a huge topic that I can really only cover certain areas, but I wanted to get to some major ones, major ideas and major things going on now so that, you know, hopefully you can be more aware of them. And please feel free to contact me and ask me questions. I mean, I don't mind at all. You can ask me on Facebook, you can email me, you know, I mean, that's part of what I do. So you're not bothering me by asking me questions. Okay, just I want you to know that you're not bothering me. <laughs> so, thank you so, much. so uh, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for your questions and for listening this long. And I really enjoyed it. We did too. Thank you. Thank you again. Take care, everybody. Have a good you. Bye bye.